Welcome to our podcast, proudly brought to you by VPA Australia, our trusted supplement provider since Unity Gym started. As sponsored athletes, we're excited to offer you a special 10% discount on top quality supplements that ship worldwide. Just use our discount code from the description. To avoid international shipping fees, contact VPA and tell them we sent you to get a flat shipping rate. Today's episode is also sponsored by the Flexibility Blueprint. Ever felt lost in the sea of social media fitness advice? The Flexibility Blueprint is your map to progress, designed to help you get laser focused on what matters most for your journey in flexibility and strength. And guess what? It's free. Grab it using the link in the description. If you're starting your flexibility journey, don't miss our 20 minute mobility routine. It's your first step to quick wins in flexibility. For those further along, use our Flexibility Masterclass, featuring advanced techniques like loaded stretching and end range strength for the pancake, front splits, middle splits, and more. Links for both are also in the description. And for the seasoned athletes, avoid the frustration of complex training puzzles with our UMS Tribe membership. It's a different online coaching experience with strength and flexibility combined. Don't forget, we're Amazon affiliates too. You can find all the equipment used in our videos and podcasts at the most competitive prices with our affiliate links in the description. Now let's dive into today's episode. Good uh, good day, everybody. Sorry, I didn't know where I was then for a second. Uh, I am here with uh, Phil White uh, from philwhite.me, is it? That's my oh, website cool. name. Phil White Physio Phil is my White current business me. name, but yeah. I'm just and yeah, you're just you're just stalling because you didn't come up with a cool name for me like you usually do. So I was I was getting there. I was getting there. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> uh, and um, uh, Phil is if you if you don't know Phil, uh, if you've been sleeping under a rock, he's the world's best physiotherapist. No, I I I mean that though. Um, we've worked together for quite a long time. The reason why I say that he's one of the best that I've uh, met in the business is because. He's got a lot of skin in the game and, uh, you know, there is um, seldom a sport that he hasn't uh, dabbled with, uh, uh, including, you know, um, ultra marathons, ocean swimming, cycling, uh, ultimate frisbee, crossfit, you know, weightlifting, powerlifting. Uh, he has had uh, the pleasure of working on and with some of the world's strongest people. Uh, did you ever treat Hathor Bjornsson? Or did no, you I didn't just it didn't work out when he was it was when he was in town, unfortunately. But yeah, worked with his with Hathor's strength coach, which is called the Mountain yeah, from Game of Thrones, heaviest ever deadlift. So yeah, been around some pretty has, strong people. <laughs> he has had Alex uh, Simons on his table, who is the uh, godly strong. Uh, one of the world's Mad. biggest human beings when you meet him <laughs> surprisingly a lot smaller than half thor uh yeah. but um and sebastian orab of course aka australian strength coach and all of those amazing power lifters and uh so he's uh you know very very well versed when it comes to strength training and gym yeah, I've, done, related I've done most injuries. of the sports and i've injured myself i've got most of like the classic sports injuries from basically every sport i've tried <laughs> because yeah before yep. i started learning about this stuff because I was so frustrated as someone who loved exercise, but just kept on nailing myself whenever I tried. So that started a path of, yeah, many years of education and, um, and yeah, there was the, definitely the formal education, but learning so much from working with you guys, working with Sebastian Oreb, uh, you know, I've employed a coach for running, who's a dual Olympian. I've, I've like always tried to seek out the people who really do the practical stuff <laughs> because, uh, in physio education, you, you learn so much, obviously, like, and the sports science degree, you learn so much, but there's a bit of a difference between what's taught in, in a university versus what you learn from actually doing and, and work with people who make it their lives to figure out the best way to do things. Because yeah, you can't perform at a high level without uh, doing it in a way that you avoid injury. So it makes so much of a difference though, in the way that you practice, because the difference between us, a physio and Rad and I talk about this all the time, uh, but the difference between a physio physiotherapist who works with athletes and their role is their job is their number one priority is to get that athlete uh, functioning at a high level again and back out on the field in comparison to someone who, you know, really relies on the repeat uh, business of a, of a patient. I think the two models are very, very different. And so I, I do mean it when I say uh, he, he's one of the best in the business uh, just because of that skin in the game, you know, and, and uh, ha having that understanding. And, I, and, you know, it shows in the practice because you guys treat people with barbells, not rubber bands all the time. You know, like I've, I've seen it so many times where uh, the moment you go into uh, an injury 
frame like, oh, I'm hurting or I've hurt myself or I'm compromised or you get a diagnosis, you go into the naughty corner and now you're doing banded exercises and, you know, you're not allowed to touch the cool stuff anymore. Uh, and that is really what we want to, I want to talk about today. Well, we had, you know, hang on, before you jump forward, that, that was something that we had a real problem with. If you remember Yanni, because Yanni and I have been coaches for um, almost 20 years now. I think this might, next year is the 20th year. And um, we used to have a real problem where we used to send our clients to uh, physios and they would come back looking really perplexed saying, oh, I can't do any of this stuff. I have to sit on the floor with a band and try and activate my TVA, um, you know. <laughs> and that was, uh, if, if, if people don't know what that means, it's the transverse abdominis and it was a physio classic. And we got really upset because we ended up, I wouldn't say having it out, but kind of politely, like having it out with some physios going, you know, you, our clients are coming back like fearful of going to the gym and saying they can't do it. And it was, it was a real thorn in our side. And so it was a really big asset for us when we developed the relationship that we have with Phil and Nilesh and um, Leroy, who were physios that weren't doing, them, doing that. They weren't sending people back with this fear of exercising. They were sending them back actually feeling quite empowered and feeling like, oh, you know what? I'm actually not as broken as I thought I was. So I just wanted to throw that in there. Yeah, cheers. And yeah, it's not to say that like there's never a place for bands or, you know, I mean, I've yet to find a time where I've suggested someone does TVA exercise, but like there, are like physios, <laughs> there's some really great physios out there who are really good at like doing specific diagnosis. But I think like the industry it, and the profession, it's kind of just drilled into you to be quite conservative. And when, with all the kind of medical legal, legal stuff that surrounds it, it can be a bit scary. Like, it, you know, it, it, as, as you guys know, like I'm always chucking in disclaimers and all this stuff because like there is that sort of when you, when you are a upper registered like health professional, like you, you do get a bit, you know, you've got certain levels of, um, I guess, authority that mean that, yeah, you have to be quite conservative in how, how you go about things. But unfortunately, I think that leads to people just being under trained and, and developing, yeah, that kind of like, injury identity being told they can't do anything ever again. So, and I, I was very fortunate and, you know, I, I did choose that when you guys gave me the option to set up my gym, uh, sorry, to set up my clinic in a gym that it was right there. I could go out there and I could really guide people through it. Whereas if I was in another clinic down the road and being like, yeah, go train with these guys up the road. I've never met them. I don't know what they do. Like you would probably have to be a bit more conservative there. So I do see where they come from, but I've just always tried to put myself in a position where, um, yeah, I can actually get people back into doing things that are, as close to real training as possible because I've just been on the other side of that so many times and that's led to some of the most down and like, you know, there's definitely a period in my early twenties where I was just depressed because my whole identity had been stripped from me because I was just injured so many times and I was trying to be, you know, a competitive athlete and I was just stuck there, like just sitting in the dark room, depressed and putting on weight like because I just couldn't do anything. And I just got so freaked out by even trying. So I've really been on the other side of that. I know that, yeah, even if you do have a significant injury, um, say to your upper body, you can still get into the gym and, and, and kind of maintain that momentum, maintain that identity by working on something and feeling like you're a capable uh, person and you're, you know, you're still part of the crew and you can still, uh, you know, do things with your body because it's just so, yeah, it can really mess with you if you, uh, if that's taken away from you. Anyone who's been put in the naughty corner before, uh, sl <laughs> smash the like button and, uh, and let us know in the comments. Uh, what 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 was your injury and what were you told to do? And by by being put in the naughty corner, of course, I'm uh, I'm referring to uh, the rehab stigma. Uh, you are now compromised, therefore you must not uh, partake in the uh, in, in the activities that compromised you. Um, and uh, you know we've done. I won't go into it because we've done lots of podcast episodes on the fact that it's never the the exercise that hurt you. It's how you got there. It's the the, the mismanagement of load. But really, want to, what I want to dive into today is uh, is is the is literally the process. Let's let's say uh, hypothetically, someone has just been diagnosed with a slap tear in the shoulder. Uh, when can they start exercising? And what you know, sh what would the process be for you, Phil, uh, if if this was your client? So speaking of conservative dis disclaimers, I'm going to suggest that if you do have a slap tear, that you know you really are working with a professional because these those kind of injuries like. There's some uh, serious consequences if you. Sorry, I think my internet might have just cut out there. Still. Yeah, yeah. start again. Just start. Start sorry. again with your sorry. disclaimer. Yeah. We got you back now. <laughs> yeah. Cool. <laughs> we we'll got um, you back. Yeah. So with the, I'm going to start out with a bit of a disclaimer there because 
obviously if you do have a significant injury like a um a slap tear or or any injury like it's always worth working with a professional who you know even if they are on the conservative side of things just getting an idea of exactly what's going on or close enough to exactly what's going on and and a bit of a guidance on like tissue healing times and how serious consequences are give you an idea of that risk but then what i say is like get into the gym that day the next day uh <laughs> as soon as possible or and and train something else like get up get in there and, and do some lower body work do some squats go for a jog like whatever you can just to maintain that momentum because like exercise and motivation is just such a momentum game where when you're exercising well you sleep better when you're sleeping better you manage your stress better when you're managing your stress you eat better when you're eating well your body composition goes well and you, your energy levels are great and then you um you know you're less exercise likely to kind of, yeah you're less <laughs> likely to be in pain and then you end up really motivated then you exercise more and it's just this really positive health spiral which is like a big part of what i work with my clients on is, is identifying in that spiral like how do we make sure that we never like go backwards we can quarantine one area and then maintain that momentum um so i think it's just so key to get it there and do something as soon as possible and i've talked about this in, in previous episodes where it's like making the rehab of like the specific injury like if it's a really bad injury you're like whole focus just makes it such a unenjoyable and frustrating experience because you're just constantly assessing like am i am i hurting is it okay like is this getting worse and obviously that's important to consider all those things but if you can do that in the context of also working on some other areas of um whether you know of your exercise so getting in if you have a slight tear doing some uh yeah lower body work um uh if, or, or running or something like that where you're feeling progress you're feeling momentum it just means that it, it doesn't kind of become all encompassing and really start to mess with your with your mindset and how, you, how you're feeling so uh that would be my overall like <laughs> way of thinking about this yeah absolutely and, and so um disclaimer aside uh, uh now let's talk about specific shoulder uh exercises so yeah. you know um i know that there's different levels of a slap tear and and there's different severities and things like that um so obviously without having that information we just have to make an assumption or we'll create our own you know uh fantasy case study uh, where it's a moderate uh, severity slap tear, um, what would you, what would you be suggesting? Uh, what would you be probably restricting people, or you know, is it a matter of uh, training? Yeah, I mean, I can talk to personal lot. experience in this one because it's yeah, it's yeah. an injury that I've had. We've yeah, we've had uh, plenty of it seems like it, you know. It, everyone's collecting a slap tear in, in this group of people. So, <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so I've, I've had one, yeah. Rad's had two. Yeah, Rad's yeah. had one, you know, it's a, a sign of a life well lived, I think, if you're getting out there yeah, and that's, doing that's, stuff that's, that can lead to a slap Phil, tear. Phil, don't rob me, buddy. I've had two. I've had two Ooh, slap tears, one, one in each shoulder. So, you know, I mean, <laughs> you guys are there, but you're, you're only halfway. Yeah, yeah, get on my level. <laughs> um, yeah, so mine happened with a, with a sports injury where I had a guy collide with me and my shoulder just, um, uh yeah sunk down i was not really training much in the gym at that stage and just um yeah got the the tore the cartilage and so again for the slap tears if people aren't uh, aware of that well, yeah is, what i was just, what the, i was just gonna say sorry to interrupt is let's explain what a slap tear is first maybe rad can bring up a diagram from uh, dr google or something like that uh and while while you explain it phil yeah so it's got it's the, the slap tear refers to the like the labrum in the shoulder so it's like um, superior later anterior posterior is what slap stands for and basically it's the cartilage in the ball and socket joint it's sitting in the socket and it like it, the shoulder's kind of a funky joint because you've got these like spindly little um socket and then you got this massive ball like it really doesn't look like it sort of fits properly and that's to allow the full range of motions that we can go overhead unlike your hip joint where you can't lift your hips up by your, your ears unless you're a um uh, contortionist you, you, your shoulder's got this amazing range of motion because it is quite a shallow um and not all encompassing um uh joint uh socket so to get around that you the body's quite clever and it's got these um extra passive support structures so this cartilage that sits in there and makes a bit more of a, a a solid um connection point for the the ball to sit in but on the top section of that you've got this attachment site for one of your bicep tendons so um your bicep attaches into a few different places but um one of them is into that uh top part of your of your labrum so it's a really common one that you yeah can um into the shoulder and then start to get this sort of you know th this bicep issue so when we're talking about like degrees of uh injury and whether you you know can get straight back into training or not like it really does matter um how <laughs> how injured it is and you know if you have completely ruptured the bicep that's going to be a very different um answer 
Well, it's, it's quite a, like a, it is quite a different answer to um, a regular one. But the the key thing to remember is even if you have a super severe injury, it is worthwhile trying to maintain muscle mass and maintain strength by using the neurological uh, tools that we have. So using the brain to basically maintain muscle mass. Because in previous episodes, you might have heard me talk about how neural drive is a big part of the strength um, and hypertrophy in your muscles. So it's the signal you get from your brain that basically goes and gets the muscle fibers, the motor units, um, and activates them. So what's quite cool is that if you train the other arm, you get a bilateral signal. So if you go really heavy on the other arm, you can send that same signal that goes down through the arm um, on the other side and helps actually maintain and, and even build strength if you're fairly new to training on the other side. So why that's important is because, yeah, the like deconditioning that can happen with an acute injury where if you have something that does need surgery, for example, like immediate surgery, if you're not able to really load at all through that shoulder for six, you know, six weeks, eight weeks or so, um, then that's a long time, uh, particularly as you get older, where you can get some like significant deconditioning, some muscle wasting um, through that structure. So by training the other side immediately, getting stuck in there, making sure you're getting that good neural drive, um, bilateral neural drive, um, that's going to really help. And you can do that by training bilaterally. There's also some really interesting stuff around imaginary training where you sit there and imagine really hard that you're, uh, you know, in a gym, you're pushing weights. Like that has been shown as well to actually, um, yeah, stimulate maintenance of muscle mass um, by activating that neural drive. So yeah, definitely do the contralateral one if you want to get imaginary as well, then um, by all means do that. This, but yeah, this, that, that is something you can do immediately, day dot, um, to maintain some good strength. And you're not joking. We can no. actually sort of like imagine ourselves stronger. Not stronger, but you could imagine yourself slowing down the decline. <laughs> Probably yeah, would be the, yeah. the way to put it. I, like, I, yeah. I know the answer to that, but I just wanted to probe because I wanted you to, to, yeah, to, to yeah, reaffirm that it is a legitimate yeah, training stimulus super, super interesting um but yeah, yeah. That, that neural, neural drive is so much um you know brain dependent because it is that signal coming from the brain and you know we briefly talked about how some of the different um, factors of your training can influence it but like you know if you have a lot of caffeine if you're um really amped up and people taking they you know they did some studies back in the day of uh actually giving the 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 people in the study cocaine uh, to really <laughs> ramp things up amphetamines um <laughs> They slapped on the back. They set a gun off next to their um, uh, their ears, and like that increase in activation um, of the brain also then led to an increase in that neural drive. So just to, that's why like do it, when you're doing it, it's not just like oh there I go. I've imagined training quickly. It's like you really have to kind of get into it and believe it. So and again, not suggesting they do any of those things in those studies. Those, those studies aren't allowed anymore because they have ethics boards <laughs> that stop that happening anymore. But um, yeah, it's just an interesting place where you can start with um, that from day dot. And what's quite nice about that is it just gives you that kind of sense of like control and progress as well. Because again, it is often that just demoralizing um, thing with an injury where you feel like there's nothing I can do. I just got to wait it out. And then you just distract yourself away from um, exercise, which then, you know, means that you might just spend your whole day, I don't know, playing computer games, or whatever, and you stay up too late. And then all that <laughs> negative health spiral happens because you've just like totally disengaged. So I think one of the most important things to the health is always to just stay engaged, stay intentional, even if that means doing something little, but tick the box, take the win and then, um, move on. But so that's yeah. Day, day one, you can do something. Yeah. And, and we like Rad and I have had such an amazing, uh, uh, result from our, from our shoulder rehab training, which re really, uh, started because, um, when I, I injured my shoulder first, I got my, my slap tear in 2006 and it was really like qu quite embarrassing to talk about it, but it happened on the dance floor. I did a, a, a trick Again, off the wall. Slap tears are a sign of a life well lived. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's right. That's right. I, uh, I didn't make a, uh, a backflip off the wall and had to sort of put my hand down my, my arms down to turn it into sort of like a back handspring, ha uh, handspring, like a backflip instead of a back somersault. And, uh, it, yeah, it ended in a world of pain, but, um, long story short, I worked with, that's when I first met Leroy and, uh, and built that relationship. And, what surprised me was that Rad, um, it would have been a decade later when he experienced a similar injury. I think he was doing calisthenics, I believe. Rad, uh, you, you can probably talk about the, um, uh, the mechanism uh, better than I can remember it. But uh, the exercises that Leroy prescribed, Rad, were really basically the same. And he had this whole theory of 
you know, um, the way he explained it to us was that the, 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 the scapular stabilizers and the rotator cuff uh, tend to sort of forget to do their job uh, after quite an acute injury like that. And, uh, you know, th th it's very important to sort of, before you start heavy lifting again, just retrain the stabilizers and the rotator cuff, r remind them uh, what they're doing. Uh, and, uh, and then as quickly as, you know, is, is uh, right with the guidance of the right um, professional, it reintroduce your pushing and pulling uh, movement patterns, both in the horizontal and vertical plane. Um, what are your thoughts about that uh, that sort of process that that uh, uh, system? Yeah, sure. So like pain pain inhibition and and yeah, your body's pretty good at like shutting down areas <laughs> that are in like an acutely injured place. So like the yeah the neural drive sort of slows down and the the muscle activation really um, you know sort of turns off for one a bit of a word because your body is trying to be like wait don't do this thing and that's what pain's all about. Like pain's super useful for um, in the acute stage to be. Uh, a good signal not to to really load up something that needs to go through sort of some acute healing um but yeah where it is they're no longer useful as if you don't start to reactivate those muscles you don't get start to um get them going if you don't maintain that muscle mass throughout um the rehab process then you really do decondition in a big way so um with all shoulder training like that's the interesting thing that i've kind of come across with i mean change my you know thinking of with exercise over the years is like you kind of go into physio and you you think you're just going to be yeah doing all these banded like very isolated rehab exercises but like the most effective rehab is like training the whole system so that's going to be a combination of the you know the big prime movers the pushing and pulling muscles doing that in a structurally balanced way as you guys do with you know horizontal pushing and pulling uh vertical and um and horizontal planes it's about getting those um the so the muscles you talked about there so the axioscapular muscles so the ones on the shoulder blade that then provide a really solid base of support so the muscles of the rotator cuff um can do their job effectively and the rotator cuff its job is to get the ball in the middle of the socket so when you talk about what the labrum does it is trying to get the ball in the middle of the socket by being a, a passive structure attachment but then that's also what the external rotators are doing so if you have just got like a um external uh, a labrum injury without any external rotator or rotator cuff damage um, or, or pain, then yeah, you can, as soon as like, you know, symptoms allow and work with your professional, like you can try and get those muscles nice and active. And that's actually going to unload the labrum itself, which in an acute stage may, uh, decrease the pain. So yeah, you want to try and do that as quickly as possible. And, and, and that's going to be guided by a professional, but we talked about the different load variables of strength training the other um, day with the, yeah, basically intensity, volume, speed, range of motion, um, and exercise selection and complexity. And if you can navigate those and be like, okay, I'm going to start light and I'm going to start um, low volume and I'm going to start small range of motion. So probably an isometric contraction, speed again, isometric contraction. And I'm going to start with a really simple isolated movement in a position that is as uh, advantageous to the shoulder as possible. So not at end of range, just in like a really controlled position. Like if I can start at the easiest version of those variables, and, and again, I, I talk about like the exercise ladder, like get onto rung number one <laughs> and can I do that? And if so, like testing um, where you can sit by increasing each of those variables and testing like which one is actually the aggravating one. And typically with yeah a, a, a joint injury, like that range of motion can be really challenging. Obviously also um, the other ones, but um, yeah, if you can start nice and easy, start isometric and get into that quickly, that's just gonna help again, maintain that muscular activation of the muscles whose job it is to unload that passive structure that's injured. Yeah, so you know, if we bring this in for a landing, in summary, would you agree uh, that there is always something that you can do? So going back to this initial question, and this actually did come from a uh, a, a, a subscriber on YouTube uh, re responding to one of the slap tear videos that Rad put up. Uh, that Look you know, we do when subscribers, maybe you should subscribe to if you're listening. Yeah, that's right. Ask questions when... and we'll answer them. Whole episodes. That's right. That's right. <laughs> when can i start exercising i've been diagnosed with a slap tear and uh when the the exact um terminology was used was when can i start rehab now the the you know there is this concept that we talk about all the time of avoid putting yourself in the naughty corner and taking on that injury identity uh i think that based on what you've said here there is always something that you can do and that you can do immediately and there is seldom a time in the absence of like a severe bone fracture or something like that, or that you've just been cut open, you know, you've just gone under the knife and had a, a major surgical intervention um, 
there's usually always something you can do. And that may yeah, just even, be even, even those like, like you still for a bone fracture, like you can do contralateral training. If you're just being cut opening, you can do imaginary training. Like there's always like the rungs, like <laughs> unless you're unconscious, like there's always something you can do. And I think that's really powerful to remember because it, it it's that feeling of like powerlessness and the feeling of like, you know, just disengaging from yep. your health and your life. Like that's the most dangerous part of not, being uh yeah like not kind of keeping exercise part of your life forever so i think i think on a on a psychological level it goes back to what we spoke about in an earlier discussion on a different episode which is that there's this you know um i can't do all so i will do none no. uh headspace you know and uh it, to just to remind the listeners that you have this sort of uh philosophy that you uh use with your patients or clients which is um uh yes yeah, so the four tiers of yeah so four tiers, minimum yeah maintenance, progression, and optimization. So there's, you know, you don't always have to be hitting optimization for everything, which is like the quickest way to get the most progress in the shortest amount of time. And if you think expand that out to the rest of your life, like it also holds true. Like you can't optimize everything all at once consistently. So, but people set that up in their mind that they should be, and therefore it, it makes it reasonable that they don't do anything because doing that much is unreasonable. <laughs> so therefore I won't do anything. So, but you hold yourself accountable and you put yourself on the hook if, you have these four tiers because you're like, okay, well, I could do the minimum today and that will keep me engaged and keep me intentional. And, and for like a lifetime approach to health and exercise and, you know, balance in your life as well. And not, you know, getting so burnt out by your work because you're always trying to be level four there. And you're also like resenting your partner because you're, you know, they're expecting you to be level four over there all the time, like kind of recognizing this in your life and seeing, you know, how, like, where do I need to be on this scale for each area of my life and, and, and particularly in the exercise realm. Um, and, and diet realm as well. Like it's just so, so useful to have that because it keeps you on the hook and it keeps things, um, so that you're always moving forward and not just like intense and then disengaged boom and then bust. So, yep. um, yeah. And so th when it comes again, back to this sort of idea of rehabbing a slap injury, like uh, a slap tear, like again, it, how soon can you rehab? And we talk about rehab as being training in the presence of injury. Like you can rehab straight away because you can get straight into training, training your lower body, do something fun that feels good and your training in the presence of injury. Um, do something obviously to, you know, work specifically on the shoulder by doing the contralateral training, by working professional and seeing like, okay, let's test these variables out. What can I actually do here? Um, you know, can I actually do a pushing motion, but just a small range of motion with a decent sort of amount of weight, uh, probably steering clear of overhead work, but you know, can I do a, a decline uh, chest press, for example? Can yep. I do a seated cable row? Like, work with someone who can guide you through that and can take the signal of what symptoms you're, you're experiencing from it. Um, and yeah, get stuck in straight away. But there's, again, just think about the ladder. Like there's always something you can do. You just can't get off the ladder. And for God's sake, work with someone who has some skin in the game around the style of training that you like to do, which is yeah, a great the injuries end. that you've had before because yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, and in, on that, in that regard, where can they find you, Phil? Uh, my website is philwhite.me, M-E, nice and simple. Um, and yeah, I do have a free consultation button there at the moment while I have a bit more time. So if you're listening to this now, uh, you can jump on and we can just have a chat about a plan for you. doesn't mean you have to sign up for anything uh, just for a chat. And then otherwise, yeah, I'm writing every day on Twitter, putting out lots of articles, just talking about this sort of stuff. And I'm you know super interested in obviously the kind of very physiological, biological side of things. But you know, the more, longer I've done this, the more I'm interested in also that connection between the mental and how do you actually fit this into a, a human brain that is not always rational or <laughs> is you know dealing with emotions and and the, the full life experience so um yeah that's where my real interests lie and in how to um learn to love exercise so jump on twitter follow me at phil white physio absolutely and if you're ready to uh, to ditch the injury identity uh we have an amazing shoulder rehab program in the ums app that's available uh and uh if you like this content then Gently caress the like button if you're watching on YouTube. If you haven't already, uh, subscribe to the channel, hit the notification bell so you know when we post. Uh, we're posting almost every day, if not every day. And uh, if you're Ask watching, if, yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Ask questions in the comments. You know, this is this this discussion stemmed from a question in the comments uh, of one of the previous videos. Uh, Rad Rad uh, and his team answer every single comment. Uh, that's something that we're very very proud of. Uh, on YouTube and on the socials. And uh, if you're listening to us on the podcast, please give us a five-star Google, uh, not Google review, uh, podcast review. It, it uh, will help us get the podcast really going and growing. And uh, yeah, thank you very much for uh, giving us your time again, Tribe. Thank you, Rad. Thank you, Phil. And we'll catch you on the next one. Always a pleasure. See you later.